the idea of Freemasonry. Ever since man has evolved into a social being, he has felt the need for camaraderie and fellowship. It was thus that they formed themselves into groups of like-minded people sharing ideas of mutual interest. History informs us of many such ancient groups or societies. We in Freemasonry follow the legend of King Solomon of Israel, who along with his two fellow grandmasters, King Hiram of Tyre and Hiram of Biff, formed our ancient craft. Other evidence suggests that it was Nimrod, the builder of the Tower of Babel, who was the original founder of our craft. In medieval times, we see stonemasons forming themselves into guilds in the British Isles, Roman collegiums, Steinmetschens in Germany and Eastern Europe, companionage in France and parts of Europe, etc., in different parts of the world to practice what was actually operative Freemasonry. They were employed to build forts, cathedrals, chapels, and palaces, and they guarded their secrets zealously. They also had hierarchy, like apprentice, craftsmen, and master masons. These masons were highly skilled in their art and therefore the need to keep their skills a secret arose. They conceived marks of masons, methods of recognition, and a rigorous system of training. It is during this period that we also come across the term Cowan. A Cowan was, simply put, an eavesdropper an uninitiated person who, without being admitted or qualified, tried to learn the secrets of the trade. Operative masonry ended with the revolutions in different parts of Europe, as it was practiced then. Some such stonemasons decided to form themselves into worshipful lodges of speculative masons. The term Freemason, however, has a much ancient import. After the death of King Solomon in 938 BC, the Jewish Empire began to disintegrate. Israel promptly proclaimed its independence, leaving Judah with its capital, Jerusalem. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacked and demolished the temple. Israel and Judah itself were annexed to the Babylonian Empire. After the devastation of King Solomon's temple, Nebuchadnezzar enslaved the Masons until King Cyrus freed them. The most eminent among those captive Masons, Zerubbabel, a prince of Judah, demanded freedom for his brethren from King Cyrus. King Cyrus demanded the secrets of the orders of Freemasonry from Zerubbabel in return for their freedom. Zerubbabel defiantly denied the king's order and said such freedom was not worth having. Hearing this, King Cyrus exclaimed, I admire your zeal and courage. Generals, knights, this worthy prince merits liberty for his fidelity to his engagements. Zerubbabel, I grant your request and consent to your being set at liberty. You are free. The king ordered his guards to strike off the chains which bound Zerubbabel, saying, these em May these em emblems of uh, slavery never again disgrace the hands of a mason. He declared the masons to be free men, that is, they would always be free, and nothing or no one would ever enslave them. The earliest lodge minutes of speculative masons in existence date back to 1593 in Scotland. Freemasonry then, however, wasn't organized. It was about 300 years ago that a few speculative masons met at an unassuming tavern called the Goose and Gridiron 
to form the premier grand lodge of England under the moderns of free and accepted Freemasonry. Officially, the premier grand lodge of England was founded in London on St. John the Baptist's day, 24 June 1717, when four existing lodges gathered at the Goose and Gridiron Ale House in St. Paul's Churchyard in London and constituted themselves a Grand Lodge. Among them was James Anderson, a minister of the church and Grand Warden under the Grand Lodge of London, who formulated the first constitution of the Grand Lodge, which he styled as the Constitutions of the Freemasons, containing the history, charges, regulations, etc., of that most ancient and right worshipful fraternity for the use of the lodges, London, in the year of masonry, 5723, Anno Domini, 1723. However, disagreements prevailed over several issues between moderns and ancients until they resolved their differences and decided to merge. So it was on the feast of St. John's the Evangelist Day, 27 December 1813, the two English Grand Lodges came together to form the United Grand Lodge of England with the Duke of Sussex as Grand Master. Ironically, the moderns, therefore, are older than the ancients. Freemasonry spread through British and other colonial powers. In the Americas, the moderns of free and accepted Masons found a better foothold, although the ancients also existed. During the civil war between North and South, Masons fought each other, but they also aided each other. Further references to these anecdotes are found in two books, High Twelve and Low Twelve. They contain stories of how Masons on opposite sides lent a helping hand to each other at great personal risk but to remain true to their obligations. The Dutch, the Portuguese, the French, Ireland, Scotland and England all set up lodges in various parts of India. The oldest Masonic lodge is said to have functioned in what we know as Calcutta today during the last decades of the 17th century. However, these were military lodges with travelling warrants. By the end of the British rule in India, only Ireland, England and Scotland remained in India. The oldest Masonic lodge under organised masonry outside British Isles, however, is Lodge Star in the East, Calcutta, under the English constitution. Around 1954, after representations from eminent Grand Lodge officers of the day, it was decided to form a sovereign Grand Lodge of India. Thus, Grand Lodges of Scotland, Ireland and the United Grand Lodge of England, the three parent Grand Lodges formed the Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons of India in 1961. Speculative Masons chose to apply the tools of the operative Masons to their models, which literally speaking meant that instead of building cathedrals and forts, they would use models and tenets to build a Mason's character. A temple within, fit for the habitation of the Most High. It developed allegorical rituals scientific circumambulations. It also adopted ancient wisdom from different cultures and religions and wove them into a rich tapestry of its language, symbolism. Freemasonry speaks through symbols. Freemasonry also teaches us to make a daily advancement in our pursuit of knowledge by studying the seven liberal arts and sciences. A small but growing segment pursue esoteric masonry, which has 
a my, uh, uh, which has a much wider scope of research and provides a platform to reflect on Freemasonry from different points of view. Whichever method we apply to evaluate our craft, it has always lived up to its reputation. Freemasonry, through its various degrees, does not only turn a rough ashlar into a perfect ashlar, it teaches us how to live. It even tells us how we should spend each day. It conveys to us the importance of brotherly love by teaching us the five points of fellowship. It teaches us that the heart of a true mason is of a charitable disposition and extols the virtue of relief not just to our brethren but also to anyone in need. Throughout the various degrees of Freemasonry, we are taught that truth is supreme and it cannot be hidden under a bushel for long. Faith and hope are the two other teachings of Freemasonry in addition to charity. Freemasonry is a fraternity under the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Trust or faith in God or a supreme being to be precise, is not only a tenet but also a prerequisite to joining Freemasonry. This supreme being can be from any religion. It is the belief that is important. In India, we take our obligations on the volumes of sacred law of the five major religions. However, in parts of Europe, they use a blank book in some parts of the world, they take their obligations on the altar. Candidates from any religion, caste or creed can take their obligations on that book or the altar. It is, like, like much of masonry, a symbol of one of the three great but emblematic lights of Freemasonry. Thus, faith is of the utmost importance. And where there is faith, there is hope. In teaching all this, Freemasonry molds a Mason's character and takes him to an inward journey, the, the discovery of oneself. If God created man in his own image, there is a spark of his consciousness hidden unawakened in, within us. The discovery of self leads to a better understanding of the Creator and the creation. After teaching all this, Freemasonry teaches us how to die. Not just to die, but to welcome death with open arms. A man lays down, a man who is a Mason, lays down his earthly working tools to become one with the Creator in what we call the Grand Lodge above. A true Freemason is one who lives respected and dies regretted. But then a true Freemason never dies. He lives on by his deeds, the memories of the fairness of his demeanor and steadfastness of his character. It is true to say of them, they shall, they shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. So why has Freemasonry survived for thousands of years where other organizations have come and gone? What gives it its enduring appeal? Even today, there are over 6 million Freemasons throughout the globe, united in the bonds of brotherhood. Freemasonry is an art. It is also a science. It is definitely a philosophy. But most importantly, Freemasonry is an idea. An idea conceived centuries ago, which has evolved and been enriched through time. From monarchs to motor mechanics, they have all adorned the roles of Freemasonry, meeting on the level 
as equals without any qualms. When Freemasonry, uh, when Freemasons meet, they meet on the level, which not only means that they treat each other as equals, but also that they trust each other unequivocally. That is why the term brother is so important. We choose a good candidate who is like-minded and adheres to the preemptive tenets of the order and we make him our brother, a tie that is supposed to run deeper than blood. There are no material benefits in Freemasonry. A person approaching us for material benefits are and should be turned away. There are other organizations that cater to such needs. Freemasonry is not a social club either. Those who come thinking that it is are disappointed, and these are the heaviest contributors to our dropouts list. Some people come to Freemasonry not to learn, but to mold the bedrocks of Freemasonry according to their own experience in their private avocation. Freemasonry is not meant for power play, and it is certainly not an arena for ego clashes. Freemasonry, by nature, rejects these aberrations. We are supposed to enrich our lives and awaken our souls from the ancient wisdom that Freemasonry imparts, not the other way around. As I stated earlier, Freemasonry is an idea. In today's world, where people and names are forgotten so quickly, people still talk about Freemasonry, write about Freemasonry, and even make movies or documentary based on Freemasonry. And its tenets have stood the test of time. They have survived. People are killed. Genocides are perpetrated. Civilizations are wiped out. But an idea cannot be killed. I am optimistic about the future of Freemasonry because I believe in its tenets. If we imbibe those tenets within us, if we live and act by those tenets, and if we have a firm faith in the Almighty above all, then this noble institution will live on as Albert Mackey put it, the ultimate success of masonry depends on the intelligence of our disciples. So choose your candidates well, and if you love your lodge, keep it select. This and this alone will propagate the idea that is Freemasonry. Thank you.